thank y'all for coming out. Um, as y'all know, we, we've had a, a dry, hot last spring and summer, and it's a lot of issues that we've um, had to deal with with the drought. Uh, we've been in constant communication within our agency at the Texas Commission on Environmental Equality, but also with our other partner agencies, uh, trying to, to come up with ways or to identify ways and you know, bring our resources to the table to help our citizens of Texas uh, deal with the drought, different issues that came up because of the drought. And uh, with that, as we were talking about different things and, and, and communicating and bringing resources and addressing issues, you know, you all saw the news, had cities running low on water, you know, a lot of different resources came, came to bear to, to help those folks out. But we thought it'd be a good idea to do some workshops throughout the state for y'all to, to provide information that can help y'all uh, address drought-related issues. You know, we've been blessed lately with some rain. I, I've never been happier in my life to see this rain. Uh, but, you know, we could use more. So it, it, we want to make sure, and, and, you know, some folks say, hey, it's raining, the drought's over. It's, well, no, no, it's not. Uh, we still got, you know, we need some more rain. And any, any rain we get is, is appreciated, but we need more. So we, we think these, these workshops will be helpful to continue the conversation, share information, and hopefully help us uh, deal with any issues that may come up down the road. A quick overview of the agenda. What we're going to do today is uh, Mr. Charlie Adams, who's with our TCQ Small Business and Local Government Assistance, will be giving you a presentation of droughts past, you know, the 50s drought, the drought we just are, have dealt with, and then aligning out the different tools that are out there to help you hopefully address some of the issues that you have uh, might come across because of the drought. Again, thank you all for your time, and thank you all for coming out today and spending the afternoon with us. Uh, it's my pleasure now to turn it over to Charlie Adams with TCQ. Sorry. One of the things uh, that folks that deal with drought all the time uh, talk about is how it seems like when folks get ready and you've got the, the will behind it to do something about drought, it, it seems like it rains and the people ease back a little bit. And so we're, we're going to try not to do that uh, and we're going to try to move forward and, uh, and try to help small local governments, even some larger ones, to give them tools and resources that they need and one of them is this workshop. Well, like I said before, I, I am from East Texas, and some of y'all are probably wondering, like the folks in Kerrville were wondering, what does somebody from East Texas know about drought? And honestly, you know, what I know about drought is what I experienced in the last, you know, couple of years, really. Uh, as a young person, I don't, you know, I grew up in East Texas, and I remember mud and mosquitoes. I ride my bicycle through mud holes, and this past uh, summer, all I remember is dust. And I uh, don't recall having a lot of dust especially uh, out in the hunting club or the hunting lease or whatever, and uh, just eating dust all day long uh, is, is definitely a different experience for folks in East Texas too. And just on that vein, just know that uh, you know, those folks are suffering over there just like y'all are here in Central Texas and the folks out in West Texas. Uh, the next two slides are an overview of the presentation. Uh, it is essentially in two parts. First part is gonna talk a little bit about the, the drought we are experiencing now. We'll have some statistics for that, and then also some information about the historical droughts, and including the drought of record back in the 1950s. Our goal tonight is to communicate where we're at right now, and to also let you know about the tools and the assistance that we have available to help you deal with the situation. Everybody's situation is different, uh, but we've got a wide range of uh, resources to help you uh, deal with it. So we've got our overview, we'll talk about statistics and effects of drought, uh, then we'll also talk just a little bit about the statewide response, uh, which includes the, the coordination of, of a lot of different state agencies uh, to deal with drought, and uh, which in, in including that is the Emergency Drinking Water Task Force that was formed, uh, and then we'll also run through some uh, resources and contacts. Uh, it's a, the folks that are all participating together, the state agencies, it's, a, it's, a, it's an alphabet soup. I mean, we've got TWDB, TDEM, TDA, TDSHS, and we've got TCEQ rolled in there too. So got a lot of folks that we're kind of meeting under a common goal, and I think that, well, I know what that common goal is. That common goal is that we want to assist you, and we surely do not want to be the obstacle. I'll speak for TCEQ, and I know I can speak for the rest of the folks. We don't want to be the obstacle that stands in your way of doing something that you need to do to make sure that your customers do not run out of water during times of drought. The TCEQ, as well as, as my fellow state, state agencies, we want to be part of the solution. 
uh, to your drought issues. And we don't want to be the problem. We want to, together we want to maintain, we want you to help maintain a wa the water supply to your customers during this drought. Okay, weather time. I'm not a weatherman. I'm not a meteorologist or, or anything like that, but you know, I, I'm pretty good at repeating stuff that I've heard or read about. And as you can see on our, uh, the slide up there, we've got those two young people that just give us a hard time. And we've got La Nina and El Nino. And uh, what we can see is, um, if you look at this, uh, this uh, satellite imagery, it shows a cooler, or a cooler temperatures along, is, this is the Pacific Ocean, and this is the equatorial part of the, of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and you can see the cooler temperatures there, uh, abnormally cooler, I guess you could say. Uh, that's what they call, that's something that, that's part of the La Nina effect, or La Nina. And uh, you've got the warmer temperatures in the upper regions and, and this cooler temperature along the belt line of the earth here. And essentially what it results in is res it, in drier and uh, warmer than normal conditions. Uh, drought doesn't always mean absolutely no rain uh, or, or absolutely, you know, extremely high temperatures. It, it means both of them together. It's when you have uh, lower than normal rainfall and higher than normal uh, temperatures and those work together uh, to cause the problems that we've experienced uh, throughout our history as Texans. I mean, you know, you can you go online and you Google drought and you know Texas pops up. I mean, historically, you know, there's stories about droughts and there's jokes that have been told and songs written and, and poems written about drought in Texas. So it's not something that's new to us as Texans. You know, as far and one last thing on this slide, uh, one of the questions that always comes up, you know, with really and everything is what does the future hold? What is, what is the summer 2012 looking like for us? And as far as we, as far as what we're going with is that the conditions are expected to continue. Uh, the drought is expected to continue through 2012 and that's what we're preparing for. Uh, hopefully it doesn't. Hopefully we continue to get the rainfall over a nice period of time and the aquifers get filled back up and the reservoirs get filled back up but we're going to do our best to prepare for a continuation of the drought. A little bit about the to, uh, summer 2011, I actually started in, in spring. Uh, the, the stats show that it's the second worst recorded drought in the state of Texas. Uh, it goes along with a couple of major droughts that we've experienced here recently in recent times, both 99 and 2009. And most of us know about the, uh, the current drought of record. In, in the Kerrville workshop, we did have an individual there, and we may have an individual here that, was, that experienced and had some pretty interesting stories to tell about that drought of record during the 1950s. One of the concerns that we also have is that 2011 could be the beginning of a, a long extended drought like the drought of the 50s. And so we could just be on the front end of something that's gonna extend years into the future. Well, here's some, uh, some information about the, uh, the 50s drought, our current drought of record. Uh, this is uh, the, the Palmer Drought Index, and uh, it shows most of the state of Texas in exceptional drought. Uh, you know, this, this particular one, it's not, the, it's not the most up, you know, the greatest graphics or anything, but you can see just about all of Texas is suffering here. Uh, oh, and it was, and 56, was, 56 was towards the end of this, of this, uh, this, this drought from 1950 to 1957. And, you know, and a little, as a side note, you know, the end of that drought of record, the end came with uh, flash floods and lots of flooding and, and some, some pretty serious situation <coughs> as a result. So uh, 1956, the reason that I chose it uh, to, to show on the slide was 56 was the worst. I mean, it was really the, the worst year as far as, as drought goes. Some changes occurred as a result of the drought of record back in the 50s. Uh, some changes at our state level, the uh, Texas Water Development Board was formed and was tasked with planning for water needs and also providing funding for conservation and water supply projects. The Texas Water Development Board was tasked with uh, creating and maintaining or developing the state water plan and it still does that today. Uh, during this time, the first groundwater conservation district was formed. Uh, also, starting in 1957 and ending in 1980, uh, 126 major reservoirs were constructed throughout the state of Texas. 
Here we've got a, uh, a map of uh, the United States and the conditions for the 1999 drought, which was also an exceptional drought, not just in Texas, but throughout the United States. Uh, 1999, there were some changes that, changes that came about, including the uh, creation of the Drought Preparedness Council, which is a very, a very high level uh, state council. It's composed of uh, a lot of different state agencies and all tasked with developing, developing and implementing the state drought plan. In 1996, uh, a few years before that, Senate Bill 1, Senate Bill 1 required, that, uh, uh, required uh, drought contingency plans. And the thing about drought contingency plans, and pretty much I'm sure everybody in here knows what those are, and, it's ha and if you are a water system, you've got one in place, and you maybe even had to refer to it over the summer. The uh, one thing is that 30, if you're a water system with 3,300 or more connections, you're required to have this drought plan, and you're also required to let us know about it and let us see it. If you're less than 3,300, you're required to have it, but you don't need to send it to us. And so one of the situations that I think we've seen, well, I know we've seen in the summer, is that you've got a lot of these smaller water systems that when the requirement came about, they called their engineer, they called their consultant, and they got a, a drought contingency plan put together, uh, and then they stuck it on a shelf, and they never looked at it again. And times have changed, uh, populations have increased, uh, and, and situations are a lot different now. And uh, the dr a drought contingency plan is only as, as, as good as the effort that goes into prepare it and to make sure that it's relevant. 2009, this was an interesting year for the TCEQ. This was the first time that the TCEQ uh, made a priority water rights call. And this is all surface water related. It's the first time that the TCEQ issued a suspension letter of water rights. And in all, 88 water rights were suspended in 2009. Little did we know that was just the beginning because 2011 rolled around and it got a lot more serious. I'll have, I guess I've had statistics for 2011 in just a little bit, but I just wanted to share the, uh, the image here. August 2010 to, to July 2011 was the worst one-year drought ever recorded in, in Texas. Uh, we had the record-breaking heat. You know, we had a number of 100-degree-plus uh, 100, 100 days, uh, and we had that record-breaking lack of rain. And this is the, uh, this is the slide that I compare the, the drought of 2009 to, to essentially last summer, and you can see the difference. I mean, we thought, we thought it was bad in 2009. Uh, the other thing that I'll point out on this slide is you can tell, because of the exceptional drought, how small the Texas in 2011 has become versus the 2009. You guys see that? Yeah. That's a, that's, Romero told me to say that, so he gets the credit for that. But I just wanted to co contrast the two there. Nobody's escaping the, the, the effects of drought uh, this, this last summer. Uh, more numbers, and I guess what I wanted to point out is the difference. You can see this is surface water related again, water rights related. You can see the 2009, the stats there, but look at 2011, 2012. And uh, look at, you know, we've got a number of different um, watersheds or, or that were, that were affected, the actual calls went out, suspensions went out. The one that, that strikes me the most, I guess, is that this difference here, 88, I mean, we were, I mean, that, that was something we were not used to and, and we, we thought it was a big deal at the time and then we look back on this, this past uh, year or so and eclipsed it by quite a, quite a wide margin to 1,200 uh, total water rights suspended. It's a little bit over that. Now this is, uh, this is probably a little hard to read in your handouts, and so I'll talk a little bit about it. This is, the, uh, this is a graph of uh, the storage levels of, of major reservoirs uh, in Texas. And you can see the year started in 1990, run uh, through two, or two, two, 2012. And just pay real, what, what really concerns us a lot for our folks that are dependent upon surface water is this dip. You know, if you, you own stock in a company and you see this thing right here, you get a little worried. If that's your 401k or whatever. But what we're talking about here is we're talking about our, you know, that's, that's water that folks are dependent upon. Uh, not only for drinking water, but for power generation, uh, for agriculture, of course, 
you know, recreation seems like a whatever, you know, who cares about who's water skiing or who's fishing, but that's a lot of money for our local businesses and a lot of tax revenue for our uh, local governments as well. And they've all suffered. You know, again, my East Texas uh, example would be Toledo Ben and Sam Rayburn. They've all been hit real hard. In fact, I was coming back from a family reunion in San Augustine and we decided we were going to stop out and go for a swim in Sam Rayburn. And we went to our, little, our favorite little swimming hole and it was like sitting in a hot tub, except that you're about three foot of mud and it was, the, the effects are just horrible. But it was very warm, uh, very tough conditions that we're looking at. But anyway, back to reality here. We go, you see this dip here, this is what we're concerned most. And, and of course you can see a little dip kind of coming up and you know, they, our reservoirs statewide are increasing with the recent rainfall, but still, what we're worried about is, uh, we're worried about a lot of things, aren't we? If you look at 2009, we had a dip, but then 2010 was wet. We've got our, things were recharged, our, our reservoirs were, were doing good. And so we were, we were, I'll say we were sitting pretty to, to take on the conditions that we suffered in, during the summer. But the toll it took on us uh, during the summer and these reductions, we're really concerned if it continues on, if the drought continues on in the summer of 2012. We're not going to have uh, that backup supply of, of reservoir water for our surface water folks. Last thing I'll, I'll say about the uh, drought of record back in the 50s is that in, 19, in the 1950s, the, the population in, in Texas was between 7 and 8 million people. 2010, our population was 25 million people. In 2060, we're projected to be at 46 million people. So those are the, you know, as planners, as uh, folks involved in providing safe and adequate drinking water to customers, uh, those are the kind of things we, as a, as a state, we need to start thinking about and, 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 and taking steps to address. I've got a few pictures I'll share with you. Y'all more than likely have seen uh, these pictures before in some of the magazines. This is from Texas Parks and Wildlife magazine uh, and in San Angelo uh, area, O.C. Fisher Lake. Some more pictures of O.C. Fisher. Let me get a little bit closer to this area. Um, Perta Nally's River, I believe. And we talked about, you know, puddle jumping. You know, he's still got some water here and there. Pick to Lake Travis. And the next picture is from, uh, from the Lake Texana near Matagorda Bay. That's a before and after picture of, of the reduction in the surface water there as well. All right, more numbers and more of a contrast between 2009 uh, and, uh, and, and the current uh, drought. And this is a reports that we get from water systems uh, at what stage of the drought contingency plan that they're in. And uh, you can see the contrast in the numbers for voluntary watering back in 09. We had eight systems uh, call in and uh, tell us that they were on voluntary watering schedules. And then, and then we have 359 for this, this current drought that we're dealing with. Uh, the, at the, the last bullet, if you look at no outside water use, and that's usually an indication of some extreme uh, an extreme water shortage at the uh, water supply. Uh, we had two systems reporting that they were restricting all outside water uh, use. Uh, in this previous this drought we're dealing with now, we had 52. And all I'm trying to illustrate in this slide, and, and as you read through it, I won't read it to you, but what I'm trying to illustrate is that when I think of October, I don't think of of a, of a of a kind of a dry time of the year or a, or a time of year that I would associate with some serious water shortages or whatever, but, but October was the worst year uh, that we've experienced so, I mean, so far. Uh, we had a record number of systems calling in and telling us that they had less than 180 days of water supply left. That was the peak. Uh, we've And speaking of water systems, I, I'll take you back to East Texas for a little bit. 
This is Karis Cove. Uh, Karis Cove is part of the Toledo Bend Reservoir in East Texas. Um, what you're looking at is not much of a cove anymore. It's essentially dried up. Care to guess what this is? It's surface water intake. The level right here, this is the, uh, the normal level of Toledo Bend Reservoir right here. Where he's got his ladder up to. This is a sump box that the owners of this investor-owned utility um, dug a hole in the ground to drop this sump box into and hand dug a ditch from where the water was to try to get some water into their sump box so they can maintain a uh, water supply to their customers. This is another view of their intake structure and you can kind of tell but there's the, the tree line and the, you know, the Toledo Bend Reservoir would run all the way up to there. This is a close-up of the sump box and the fellow there is still working on it. They put in this uh, bar gay or bar screen, I guess, uh, to try to keep some of the larger solids. And those of y'all that deal with surface water treatment plants, you know, uh, solids, turbidity, all those things will wreak havoc on your, on your, uh, on your treatment system. Yeah, we had a number of boil water notices for these guys, but they maintain water and they haven't had an outage uh, throughout the whole time. And I guess the, the point I want to make on this slide is that the, the TCEQ recognizes the extraordinary efforts that, uh, small, that uh, these water systems, not just small ones, but all the water systems have, have gone through to try to maintain water to their customers. I mean, we recognize that. Uh, the, as far as kind of the rest of the story for these guys, uh, we're currently working on a, on a project to regionalize their water system. I mean, they're, they're small uh, and they're a sole source system. That, that surface water treatment plant is the, their only source of water. Uh, so we're working with some neighboring water systems to try to get them connected and maybe get into a, a, a wholesale contract with a, a larger entity that is essentially a regional water system right now, but trying to get them connected. All right, so that's the first quarter. The uh, response to drought, and, I, and I, I'll, top, I'll start this off by saying that the, the, you know, the governor's disaster proclamation that was made in December, just, uh, just a couple of months ago, uh, this was done in response to drought and also the wildfires that we experienced uh, during this time as well. Uh, December two, 2011, it was for all counties. Uh, due to the drought and wildfires. And, and what it means to the TCEQ and what it means to y'all is that it does allow, not just for the TCEQ, for other state agencies too, not just us. It allows us a little flexibility in, in rules, state, state rules, state law. Uh, it doesn't allow for flexibility on the federal rules, but it does for some of the, the state rules that we have. I will tell you this. We'll work with you as much as we can, but the thing that we can't hedge on is the safety and public health. Okay, so if we're talking about public health, those are some things that are just not on the table for discussion. But other things, like capacity, uh, some stuff that's on paper that we'll require and that you'll get an NOV for if you're not meeting it, if you get an investigation, those are the kind of things that we can talk about because this is an extreme situation. What, what my bosses keep telling me to communicate to you is that the game has changed. It's not business as usual. We've never been here before. The TCEQ has never been here before. And so, again, in an effort to not be the obstacle, uh, we're, we're here in, 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 you know, by being in this, this room right now to try to work with you to make sure that you don't run out of water for your customers. Well, I, I guess I should cover the slide a little bit. Uh, it has been multi-agency coordination, like, like I've already mentioned, we've got a lot of folks at the table, a lot of folks talking, uh, working with each other, taking a look at each other, how we do things, offering up suggestions on how to do things better to better serve y'all. Uh, we had a number of water rights suspensions that we had to do, and we've activated our drought hotline. Uh, I've got, there's a slide on here coming up that has on there, but I'll give it to you now since we're, it's, it's fresh. It's one 800 447 2827. 
It is in your slide packet, but I just thought I would holler it out now. The drought hotline, essentially, you know, if you've got questions, if, if you're dealing with a drought situation uh, and you kind of don't know where to go, it's a TCEQ manned uh, hotline. You give us a call and we can get you in the right direction. The folks who answer the phone are small business and local government assistance folks, and we're a little bit different from some of the other people at TCEQ. We're not enforcement. Okay, we have an agreement with the enforcement side of the house that we can offer confidential assistance to folks who call that, that number. Okay, so, you know, if you're hesitant to call because you're worried about getting an NOV or going to enforcement or having a visit by your friendly neighborhood investigator a couple of days later, that's not how this is done. Okay, we'll, we'll do what we can to assist you. Extensive outreach to, to public water systems. Uh, of course, we, we love to send letters and postcards, but we also manned the phones and we called, we called systems that uh, were sole source systems, ones that only have one water source, one well, uh, and systems that were reporting mandatory water restrictions. We actually physically called them on the phone and say, hey, how's everything going? And trying to get some more information from them, try to put them in contact with some folks that can help them. The uh, drought website, I'll put a plug in for that real quick. If you go to our drought website, there's a, there's a reporting form. This is voluntary. And this, is, this is something that's alarmed us a little bit because we're concerned about those water systems that we don't know about that are getting really close to running out of water. The folks that maybe they're a sole source groundwater system and the only time they know that they have any trouble is when they start sucking sand or sucking air, you know, and then they have no alternatives. Those are the kind of folks that we want to try to get a hold of on the front end and look at some alternatives and some maybe some, some other, something else to help them through uh, a troubled time with their water. It is voluntary, but I highly recommend that you put your information uh, in there and get it so they will know about it. Another slide on the agency-wide response. Uh, we identified priority public water systems. Of course, you know. Everybody here representing a uh, public water system wants to be a priority public water system, right? Well, not always. I mean, we, when we first started doing this, and it, it, what it, this, this list of public water systems uh, is, is referred to sometimes as the 180-day list. It's those systems that are reporting less than 180 days of water, and it's a water shortage due to drought. And what we've had to do is we've, we've got calls from folks saying, hey, I'm... I'm you know, I'm probably about 30 days away or I'm two weeks away and we'll say, well, what, what happened? So, oh, well, my, my well collapsed or and, and maybe, maybe it's not related to drought. Maybe it is. Uh, but if it's not, one of the ways we were able to, you know, we still helped them, of course, but they won't necessarily go on, the, go on this list unless they're 100, within 180 days of running out of water and it's a drought-related shortage. Uh, this a group uh, meets every week and each one of these systems that's on this priority list is assigned a project manager. I'm a project manager. I have three systems that are my systems that I contact every week, at least once a week. And I'll tell you what, in October, uh, one system in particular, I called them every day. Uh, you may have heard of the city of Grosbeck. Uh, they were within days of running out of water. They were on CNN and Fox News and uh, a lot of press and everything around their, their situation. They're a sole source surface water system. Uh, their sole source of water is the lower Navasota River. Uh, the, what we saw happening with the, those guys is, and I actually went out, it's, yeah, I actually got out and went and took a look at something, which I, I appreciate the comment over there, but, um, you know, went to Grossbeck, took a look at the situation. Well, Grossbeck has right next door Fort Parker Lake. And it's a big, really nice lake, and I look out and I see all this water, and I'm thinking to myself, why are these, why are these folks calling us? They have all this water right next door to them. And the fellow that I was with, he kind of nudged me, he says, well, you need to look a little bit closer. You see that bird out there? And there was a little shore bird, and he was walking on the water because the water was only about six inches deep or, you know, maybe four inches deep. It was very shallow. The lake was built during the Great Depression by the Civilian Conservation Corps as a recreational lake. It was not built as a drinking water reservoir. Uh, what that lake has turned out to be for the city of Grosbeck is essentially an impediment 
to the Navasota River flowing down and getting to what they call the lower Navasota River where their surface water intake is. What's happened is the water that will flow down naturally would essentially collect in the lake and fill up the lake before it would flow over the spillway and get down into Gross Bay. So we were looking at that issue and the city, of course, they're working around the clock to try to come up with a, a solution to the problem and, and the rest of the story is they ended up buying two uh, abandoned quarries or out of service quarries uh, about seven miles away from the city and each one of those quarries are full of water and they bought the water in there and they dealt with our water rights folks on, on the water purchases and the, the, the diversion of the water. They put in a, a temporary pipeline or they actually they proposed to put in a temporary pipeline along uh, some right of way and seven miles of right of way and so if, if, you, if you deal with water and sewer uh, in your contracting, you're starting to hear dollars start to add up. And it, start, you know, it got to be a pretty unwieldy project to put all that in the, on the ground, actually in, not in the ground, but on the ground. Uh, but as a, an example of, of how the agencies at the state of Texas work together to try to help grow spec, TxDOT and Texas Parks and Wildlife and TCQ, uh, among other agencies, got together and they came up with a plan to run that water line through Fort Parker State Park. And so they went from seven miles of pipeline to three miles of pipeline, it's temporary. Well, and also they got their helping hand from uh, a water system east side of the city of Nacogdoches lent them a, a pump that would have cost them, I believe it was $5,000 a month to rent. They put the pump on the ground, they connected it, they run the line. Of course the line, the temporary line, they had to rent it at a cost of $25,000 per month. They put it all in. So Thanksgiving holidays, I'm, I'm talking to the public works director and they're installing the pipe and I say, well, how are things are going? Oh, it's fine. We're installing the pipeline in Fort Parker State Park in the middle of a rainstorm, but we're still moving ahead. You know, that didn't do... <laughs> they were putting it all together. They got everything put together. They tested it, worked like a charm, and moved the water uh, around Fort Parker uh, Lake to their outfall and they haven't had to use it. It's rained, all that. They kept the pipe, I think, for three months, maybe two months. And uh, they finally sent the pipe back to the, to the owners of the pipe because the $25,000 a month was getting hard to justify. But that's the story there. And that, that's so typical of drought. You, 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 you go into crisis mode, you get the plan set up, you get everything set up, and then it starts to rain on you. But you can't let that take away your desire to move forward and try to get a plan in place. Uh, to deal with it. So that, is that my second story or my first story? I don't know. <laughs> Let's see. So again, we, this uh, priority public water systems list is transitioned into the 180, uh, 180 day list and we give updates uh, weekly. We actually had our meeting today. Uh, the, uh, the meeting, the, the group that meets is called the Emergency Drinking Water Task Force. That's cool. Name. And uh, these are the folks that are involved, and it is a coordinated multi-agency uh, res uh, response to the drought. Uh, some of the things that we, you know, we talk about multi-agency folks talking to each other. Gross back on the front end when they were still looking at running the line along TxDOT right away, you got to get permits from TxDOT to get that done. They, were, they had done it before, and they're like, oh, it's going to take too long. There's no way. The clock is ticking. We're about to run out of water. We were able to get a hold of some folks at TxDOT and they had engineers out the next day walking, walking the site, going from place to place to get it uh, addressed and they had those permits in hand within a couple of days after that. So we were able to fast track that. Parks and Wildlife folks, again, they stepped up. They did whatever they needed to do to make sure that it got approved to run that temporary water line through their park. One other example of the coordination uh, resulting in a positive thing for a water system. One water system was relocating their uh, intake uh, and they needed a power source where the intake was going to be relocated and evidently the owner of the water system didn't get along with the manager at the electrical co-op and they had history. Well we were able to get a hold of some folks and they said look we'll get that power drop within 24 hours of your request. I mean I think what happens is folks get the message. Uh, this this uh, this effort goes to the very top of state government to try to make sure that you folks continue to have water to supply your customers. Let 
next few slides are uh, just numbers there. Hopefully they're, you're able to read them in your handouts to refer to uh, their phone numbers, their uh, uh, web addresses. And then I've got some screenshots of the, of the websites for, uh, for some different folks. I'll, I'll give a, um, you know, what I'll say about the Texas Water Development Board's website is it's a great, great resource for both groundwater and surface water systems. Uh, they've got a lot of good maps. They've got a lot of good resources. They, they have funding. Uh, they, they, they fund uh, water uh, utility uh, projects uh, all the time. Folks that have been in the game for a long time know this. They also offer uh, water loss audit worksheets. And if, if you're a water system and you haven't done a water loss audit in a while, it's a good idea to do it. If you're dealing with an aged infrastructure, it's a good idea to take a look and you can target areas of your water system that you can put a priority on on replacing lines. And that's going to help you in the long term deal with drought when water shortages start to rear their ugly head again. Of course, here's the TCEQ's uh, drought web page, and there's that phone number that I gave you a, a few slides earlier. Here's a screenshot of, uh, of our web page that we've got. And, and by a show of hands, how many of y'all have been on the TCEQ website? Everybody's about everybody in here. And, and I'll tell you, it's got everything you could possibly want to have is on that, on that website, except what you're looking for. <laughs> and I promise you it's there. The information is there. At times, it is very difficult to find. Now, we're doing what we can to make it better. In the meantime, I'll offer this to you. That drought hotline number, if you're looking for something specific and you can't find it, Give us a call. Sometimes it's helpful. And I can't tell you how many times I've done it. Folks will say, hey, I'm looking for this. Guess what website I'm on most of the time? The TCEQ website, looking for information to, to provide for my customers. We can provide that service for you to try to find the information that you're looking for on that website. Here's a screenshot of the PWS drought reporting form that we talked about. Uh, again, this is voluntary, highly recommended. Let your friends know about it. When you go to your TWA meetings or your rural water meetings, let them know about it, that uh, we need their information on there. TDM, Texas Division of Emergency Management, also has a web page and, a, and a, of course, a phone number. And we have a representative here, Gabrielle is here, to answer all your questions about TDM as well. And who should be the most popular man in the house? Texas Department of Ag. Uh, these guys have stepped up in just another example of, of, of state government changing, trying to, you know, you, sometimes you could, I, I think a euphemism, a euphemism we try to make light of something, I guess, or whatever. Talked about how it's kind of hard for state government to change real quickly. I heard somebody call us, it's kind of like trying to turn a, turn a battleship. You know, you just don't turn it on a dime. It goes kind of slow. But I'll, I'll give the Texas Department of Ag some uh, credit and saying that they were able to make some changes to some of their funding or to one of their funding programs uh, to allow it to be a little more, uh, it's, I guess easier, uh, a little more uh, available for some water systems, uh, especially investor-owned utilities, uh, to get funding for, their, for, their, uh, water, for some permanent uh, water improvements or uh, for drought. Wow. So, half time. Whew, I need half time. All right, what are we looking at? What's our river? Rio Grande? Rio Grande? Colorado. 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 I think the Brazos is too blue. Brazos. What color is it? It's red. Red River. Red River. There you go. Uh, red River. Of course, funny story on this is the first workshop we did was in Nacogdoches, and I had a lady sitting on the front row. I showed this slide and I, you know, made a big deal out because it, it's, it's a pretty shocking slide, you know. Got the cow there, you know, looking kind of skinny and thirsty, looking for something to drink. And she goes, well, I'm from Wichita Falls, and I've never seen the Red River with any water in it, so that's not no big deal. I was like, oh, thanks a lot, ma'am. <laughs> so she got me on that one. I gave her her money back for the entry fee, too. All right, second half. 
We're going to get a little bit more into the nuts and bolts. We'll get a little bit more into some, some specific programs, specific, specific tools that you can use. Woo. And this is for planning. Of course, my, my word on planning is fail to plan, plan to fail. We've heard that. Uh, and, and the first question that you have to ask, or I'll ask you is, do you have a plan? Do you have a plan beyond your drought contingency plan? Do you have a plan to deal with an outage, a catastrophic outage? What are you going to do? Uh, maybe you're not responsible. You're saying, well, that's not my job. Well, I'm thinking that if you're, in your, if you're in this room right now and you're associated with the water system, yes, it's probably part of your job to at least bring it up, start talking about it, start the dialogue. What are we going to do if we run out of water? What are we going to do if the entity that provides us water runs out of water, if you're a purchased water system. Looking at your plans, you need to ask yourself, and you take a look at them, dust off, the, dust off the dust? I don't know. Take a look at them, make sure that they're relevant and they're adequate. It's a good time to do that because right now, of course, we're in extreme drought. Uh, you can kind of take and, and say, okay, are the plans that we made five or six years ago is it still relevant today with, the, with what we're looking at as far as water supply options and, and things like that? Are your trigger, do your trigger levels make sense? See, this summer should, should have been a really good time to judge and come up with that answer. Did the trigger levels in your current drought contingency plan really make sense or do they need to be tweaked? A lot of y'all have seen increases in population. Is your drought contingency plan still rel relevant based on those population changes? Things change in our neighborhoods. Are the local resources that you're dependent upon to help you during outages or other situations uh, like very low water supply, are those resources still available? Uh, the examples that we had previously were, well, we've got so-and-so well drilling company right down the road and, and you know, they've, they've helped us out in the past. Well, little did they know that that person had passed away years ago and was no longer in business. Um, engineers, well, we've got so-and-so on staff. Well, guess what? Engineers are really busy right now. You know, where are you going to fit in uh, in their priority list? Uh, if you've got interconnections with local water systems, which I, I got uh, t taken to school in Kerrville because the, there were a lot of folks, um, investor-owned utilities in Kerrville, and after the workshop they said, Charlie, you need to do your homework. These IOUs here around this area, we're 30 miles away from each other. There's no way we could do an interconnection. It'd be $10 million just to put in the water line. I was like, all right, you got me on that one. But if you're from an area that is close, you have different water systems close by, take a look at, the, at, at your neighbor who maybe you're saying, well, we've got an interconnection with CDS so-and-so. We'll be fine if we run out of water. Well, how are they doing? Do they have enough water? Are they dealing with some situations that you don't know about? So you've got to make sure all those things are relevant and still up to date. And as we talk about a water supply options, things that you can do, uh, we'll get into funding and technical resources. And we'll talk a little bit about what you need to do in case of an outage or you lose pressure. And then we'll be at the end where we can ask questions. Uh, before we get started on the assistance side, I'll just I'll give you this uh, another story. I was going down I-35 in Austin, going to a drought meeting. Of course, it's raining. It always rains when we have drought meetings. I guess we just need to have more drought meetings. I don't know. So we're, we're, I'm driving down the service road, and I see it's, it's dark. It's early in the morning, and I see some uh, police lights. And as I get closer, I see uh, a policeman, a motorcycle policeman. And again, it's raining, and I see a fellow with, the, with his car jacked up, and he's changing a tire. The policeman is assisting this individual. And the way he's assisting the individual is he's holding a flashlight on the tire. And I guess the whole point that I want to tell you in all this is that the TCEQ and anybody up here, we cannot change the tire for you. We can't fix the problem. We can't come up with the plan that's going to be what the plan that's going to fit your needs specifically. But we can help you. We've got resources. We've got a flashlight that we can shine on the problem. Okay? And we've, we've got ways and, and things that we can do to share with you to help you out. But we can't do it for you. Okay?
All right, these are the list of uh, water supply options that we've identified for water systems to take a look at and kind of be in your, uh, in your toolkit as you address drought. First one, of course, is, the, is interconnections. Take a look at them. Start talking to your neighbor. Uh, you know, a lot, of your, a lot of your best resources to solve your issues are going to be local resources, regional resources. The second we'll talk a little bit about is emergency wells and the process that you need to go through to get those approved. We'll talk a little bit about hauling water, which of course we don't want to see that, but we've got water systems today, right now, that have been hauling water uh, for a while, local systems. Uh, we've got reclaimed water, and that's taking wastewater and reusing it uh, for uh, you know, the industrial uses, our irrigation, and in some cases, drinking water. And then we'll talk just briefly about uh, desalinization as an option. Like I've said before, <coughs> things are different. Uh, those of y'all that run water systems, more than likely you've had to deal with capacity and making sure that your water system has the adequate capacity that we require by rule, uh, the TCEQ enforce, that the TCEQ enforces. Let me put this out there. If you have an opportunity to get into an inter interconnection, and I'm not talking about a permanent situation where you're constantly having water going back and forth between two systems. I'm talking about an emergency interconnection during times of, of drought or times of shortage that you can use or that your neighbor can use. If capacity is an issue, there are ways that the TCEQ can take a look at what your capacity is and offer an exception. Okay, it's called alternative capacity requirements. Uh, we do it. Uh, so don't let that be something that you use as an obstacle to say, well, we would go into an interconnection with, with you, but we can't because uh, our capacity, it, does, it doesn't work that way. Or the TCEQ uh, will, will uh, cite us an NOV or whatever. We'll work with you on those things. You need to communicate with us. Uh, let us find out what's going on and help you through it. But same thing goes with pressure. Uh, the one thing that will also uh, put the stops on projects like that is who's going to pay for it? How much is it going to cost? Sticker shock. Folks who deal in, uh, folks who, who are, are related to water systems in ways either in management or as a board member, uh, boy, your, your folks don't want to hear the words rate increase. I mean, you know, they start storming City Hall with pitchforks and torches and it's just an ugly scene. But a lot of water systems out there are essentially giving their water away. Uh, water, it, it's, it's, a, it's a valuable commodity and a lot of folks have it undervalued and it's something that you need to take a serious look at. We have folks, we have experts available to you to take a look at your current rates and to help assist you with the rate study and possible rate increase. You also have the opportunity to do surcharges or temporary surcharges. Uh, that was something that folks that just have, Grosbeck's a good example, uh, they had costs that they did not have in any budget come about because of the drought. Uh, the pipeline, the $25,000 a month for a pipeline. Uh, now I'm not saying they, they got a temporary surcharge, but that was something that was an option to them. Uh, it just seems to me that, that the words temporary and surcharge may be a little more palatable to some of your customers rather than a permanent rate increase. The other thing that, you know, that, I, that we do understand at the TCEQ is that as water systems have conserved and have done a good job of implementing their drought contingency plan, as your customers have done a good job of following the guidelines of your drought contingency plan, maybe not all of them, but some of them, we understand that, that affects your water system because your revenues go down. You, know, you get paid, you get money for the water that you provide and you build your budgets around that. Uh, there are ways that we can help you in your, in your, your rate structure to, to set it up so that you're not taking as big of a hit as your, as your uh, money coming in from your, your uh, water sales goes down. Interconnections. Last couple of slides and I'll, I'll go through these kind of quickly. The process 
uh, essentially the way you do it, if, if, if you've got something in mind and you want to move forward on it, your first call is to the regional office. Uh, the regional office will then communicate with the central office, water supply folks there. If it's an emergency, if you're looking at a water shortage in a very short term, uh, of course, that's something that we don't want to see happen, so we're going to do what we need to do to make sure that you don't run out of water. And it's, you know, we use the word like expedited review, things like that. But let me just say this about expedited review. If all water systems are all suffering from drought, if they all say, hey, I need emergency interconnect, I need expedited review, we have a finite number of engineers that review these. It's not going to be expedited review anymore. And so if you're in good standing now, but you have the ability to go into an inter inter interconnect and it's something that will work for you, start doing that now. Start planning now. Okay? That expedited review is for those truly emergency situations, uh, not for folks you know, that, that you know, could be doing things now to, to address uh, dry 2012. For interconnections, you still have to go through the plan to specs process. Uh, and you still, there's a, we've got some uh, more information for you online as far as what the, how, how it's different as far as when it's an emergency versus not. Uh, you still got to go through plan to specs. The thing is, if it's an emergency, we will expedite it. Regional office agrees with us, or agrees with y'all, it is an emergency, we will expedite it. Uh, the, there's some further guidance available on our drought page to take a look at. It kind of talks in more detail of how those things occur. All right, remember I was telling you about the uh, well driller that passed away? Well, there's his truck. I got that, I got that picture. It's actually a, a, a water well drilling rig. I mean, rig set up on a, I guess that's a Model A truck or a Model AA because it's a one ton. <laughs> The other thing I'll say is that if you're counting on the, the well driller and he rolls up in this, you might need to seek a second opinion, possibly. <laughs> Emergency wells. Again, your first call is to your regional office. And the regional office will determine whether or not it will be sent to the plan review team. And then that plan review team will send out approval letters that authorize construction only. Excuse me, they're not authorizing the use of the water uh, for, your, for your customers yet, but they will authorize the construction. It's part of the expedited process. We know that it takes time to get the thing done, and, and we don't want to be the impediment through the process. Plan spec still applies, and construction has to begin within 30 days of the approval. Now, we've got a little bit of pushback verbally on this, not really understanding why, but if it's truly an emergency, that won't be a problem for you. Usually, you'll be ready to go. And so uh, starting work within 30 days is not an issue. I'll put a plug again for the Texas Water Development Board that they do have groundwater availability reports. So if you are looking at drilling an emergency well, uh, you need to check with those guys first to see you know, what kind of historical data that they may have in your area that you're proposing to drill an emergency well. Now, I'll tell you this. Uh, one of my cities, they got the information back from the Water Development Board, wasn't too rosy, wasn't a very positive groundwater report for the area that they were going to drill, but they're still going to drill there. They're still going to do a test well and, and see how it shakes out. Hate to see the water truck. And I hope we don't have to, I hope, you, hope none of y'all that deal with water systems have to, have to get to that point, but there are a number of uh, water systems that have had to deal with that and are currently dealing with that right now. In your plan to deal with outage, if, if hauling water, which more than likely may be part of your plan or should be, you need to ask yourself some questions and that is where's the water going to come from? Uh, drought doesn't necessarily strike just one water system in the middle of Texas. It's usually a regional statewide problem. And so you need to make sure you have an adequate or an adequate source of, uh, of water to be able to haul, to be able to get a hold of it, purchase it. Maybe the folks don't want to let go of it, who knows, uh, to get it to you. Then the next question, who's going to haul it? I mean, do you have pumper trucks available? And if you're going to be hauling uh, disinfected water, uh, potable water or potable water, uh, you need to make sure that that hauler is licensed by the TCEQ. If they're hauling raw water that you will then disinfect and distribute to your customers, they don't need to be 
uh, licensed by the TCEQ. And on that, here's a list of the licensed water haulers. And this is, I know the, this information is available on the web too. I apologize for the small print. It's probably impossible to read on your, on your handouts. But the point that I wanted to make here, that's one page. That's every licensed water hauler in the state of Texas. I see the wheels are turning. I got good Americans out there thinking, ah, oh, opportunity. <laughs> Of course, I've already covered the differences there, hauling treated water versus raw water. Um, the question and what you need to take a look at in your water system is if you do start having raw water trucked in, are you set up to be able to treat that water and then distribute it? Is the plumbing set up at your water system to be able to do that? Some folks it may not be a problem, other folks it may be, but take a look at it. Uh, cost. Uh, the cost estimate that we got for City of Grosbeck to, put, to haul water to them because we were pretty close to there was $66,000 a day to haul water in. That'll hurt your budget. That's for a city of 5000 Reclaimed water. Uh, apart from the drought, using, re, using reclaimed water could be a good option for just an overall water conservation plan that you have uh, at your city or your water supply uh, corporation or WSC. It can be used for things like irrigation or industrial uses. There's a one rather large city in my region right now that is setting up a, uh, a reclaimed water uh, system. They're, they're, they're piping water to one of the refineries for the refinery to use as industrial water. Uh, and they're going to they're going to make money off of it. I mean, it's a money making proposition for them. The 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 refinery needs the water, and they are able to provide it. And I guess the folks got together and said, you know what, we could we really need our drinking water quality for for our folks, and we can use this uh, wastewater for industrial makeup water. There are rules that apply uh, in the in Chapter Two Ten for this. Next slide, we talk about wastewater used for drinking water. And just, you know, as I put as one of my bullets, the whole public perception thing is a little hard to get, get across. Now, it's being done in Texas. It's, uh, it, you know, there, there's, and it's being done around the United States. And usually what it will be is that your wastewater discharge will go into some type of, you know, uh, you know a, a water body. And then it will be drawn from, like, the other side of a water body and then used disinfected uh, a lot of folks, you know, they got the whole terminology, toilet to tap, you know, and that just doesn't go over very well with a lot of folks. They don't like to hear that. Um, but if it comes down to it, you know, we've, if, if, you know, if we've, got, we've got the processes uh, in place, you know, there is technology to do this. Uh, but if you are even considering that, let me just urge you to start the process now because it's going to require permitting. It's going to re require approval. Uh, plan now. Start getting the ball rolling on this. If you're thinking to yourself, there's no way it's ever going to happen, well, that might be a good idea. Just maybe just take a look at the possible feasibility of it to see. I know one of the things, you know, I keep using the city of Grosbeck as an example, but that was one thing that the city manager told me. She goes, you know, we're, we're, we're going so low with water, but then I go out to the wastewater treatment plant and I see all that water just going downstream and you know, wishing that they could reuse that for something, you know, and not allow it to go down. But you get into water rights issues. You get into a lot of other issues when you start messing with the, the flow of water down a stream. So, uh, you know, that's where our, our folks need to come into play. Desalinization or desal, uh, it is a treatment, treatment option uh, for brackish water. And, of course, me being from East Texas, I mean, my, my, when you talk about desal, I'm thinking of you're pulling water out of the Gulf of Mexico. And, you know, and you're solving all of our problems, you know, with this water, we're just going to take it out of the Gulf of Mexico, we're all going to be fine. Well, really, you know, what I didn't realize is there are a number of desal plants currently operating in the state of Texas. Uh, anybody want to hazard just a, a ballpark guess at how many we've got that are authorized right now for, for drinking water, just for drinking water? Just, just a, a wild guess. Somebody throw me a number. Wow, that's awesome. 100. Usually it's like 
45 or 25 or, or something like that, but there's over 100 right now that are authorized. Uh, they're different sizes, different flows. Uh, we know the thing about them is they, they're just, they cost more. They cost more to build. They cost more to operate. They're energy intensive. It's been done before. We've got City of El Paso uh, in cooperation with uh, Fort Bliss. Uh, they've been running there since 2007. Now, it's not, they don't, it's just a part of their water supply. It's not the 100%. Uh, there's also a pilot project down uh, around Brownsville, Laguna Madre project, that's actually going to be taking water from the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the uh, stats on that uh, was that the, uh, I think it was the public works director was quoted in an article saying that it was going to be three times more expensive to build and operate the desal plant than it would be to pull the water from the Rio Grande and treat. Funding resources. One of the lessons learned in all of this, uh, since is one of my my cases that I was uh, was uh, was given was an investor-owned utility or a private. Uh, they were a, uh, a corporation for profit, although they would argue on the profit part of that, uh, that they we got to look for grants and there's just none available. There's nothing, you know, and I, I, I can see the logic in that. Why do we want to give out free taxpayers' money to a profit-making company, even if they're not making profit? Bailout kind of thing, I guess. But, but TDA has stepped up and, and pretty much said if you can get your county to sponsor you as an IOU, that you could be funded to come up with a permanent solution to your drought problems or your water supply problems. Here's what I want you all to think though. I want, whenever you start thinking about funding, there's a kind of a hierarchy, I guess. The first thing you want to look at is your rates. Because as you go out, when you apply for funding, the folks that you're applying with are going to take a look at your rates. And so the first thing you need to do is to take a look, are you charging enough for water? Is your water system financially uh, healthy enough to be, you know, because, and that's based on how much you're charging and, and, and do you have a plan? It's, it's, it's all called asset management. You, know, you take a look. It's essentially how you run your water system as a business. How, how business healthy is your water system? You take a look at your rates. The, the second thing, you start looking at loans. There are loans available, very long term, 40-year loans at, at very low rates for four and a quarter percent or, or so for, for utility projects. And then, once you've looked at your rates, you've looked at loans, then you start looking around at grants. And sometimes solutions come about with a combination of those things. Rate increases, loan, and a little bit of grant. All kind of mixed together to, to pay for the project. Funding resources. We've got the Texas Water Development Board is a major funding resource. Uh, that's the financial assistance uh, email and phone number for those guys in your uh, handout. Also, Texas Department of Ag. I've got Tom's email there, and he's here. Uh, it's through their community development block grants and their disaster relief funds. Now, the Texas Water Infrastructure Coordinating Committee is not a funding resource itself, but what it is is the funding resources have gotten together and they are coordinating to come up with kind of a one-stop shop for folks looking for money to make improvements to their water system. What they're looking at is they're trying to look at the application that's required, look at the information that's required, and make it more uniform. So you're not having to jump through this hoop for this kind of funding and this hoop over here for this kind of funding. So kind of make it one hoop. And if you can get through that one hoop, then you have uh, options to choose from. We've got members of the TWIC here uh, that you, if you ask, can might be able to talk a little bit more about that. I'm going to call you out, Dorothy. I don't know if you're, are you a member of the TWIC or you, you just know everything about it. She is. Yes. So she's up here on the front row if you got some questions about TWIC. What I did in Nacogdoches is I identified I had a TWIC member there and people were like, well, I didn't know we came up with a new state agency. I, I didn't, why didn't I hear about that? I was like, no, it's not a new state agency. It's just state agencies working together. Resources. Okay, we're moving from funding resources to technical resources. 
things that can help you uh, get answers to your questions. Also to bounce ideas off of, uh, one of the things that our environmentors uh, can do sometimes is if you have an idea or you, you want to know if it's even be feasible, feasible to do something, uh, but you're really not ready to take it to your engineer yet, we have volunteer engineers. These are for small businesses and for, lo for small local governments. They, they, they volunteer a, a number of their hours every year free uh, to, to take a look at things like this and to help you uh, with, with uh, projects or, or things like that. even a sounding board. Sometimes you just need a sounding board uh, for some of these things. We also have utility environmentors, and these are usually A operators, Class A water or wastewater operators. We've got some B uh, on there too uh, that can help you if you're having operational issues uh, at, your, at your wastewater plant or your drinking water plant. The state also contracts with uh, experts uh, on, with experts on utilities. Uh, in, uh, these folks are consultants and they can assist water systems with the, with the business side of the house, uh, with the management side of the house, and they can even handle some technical uh, issues that come up. They're mostly, mostly for water, drinking water, but they do a little bit of wastewater as well. And uh, the way it works is you call us up, you let us know, hey, I need assistance with this particular issue. We can, we'll connect you with, with an FMT uh, assistance person. It's free to you. The state pays for it. Uh, so they're, they're contracted resources. They do rate studies. Or they assist with rate studies. They won't, they won't do them. They assist with them. And they also uh, can help you with asset management, what we had talked about as far as the business, how healthy your system is business-wise. They have a wide range of expertise to draw, draw from. We've also got, we also have resources uh, to help you with your drought contingency plan. Of course, everybody has one. We all know that. Uh, but in case you don't or you lost yours, uh, we do have templates available online. And the templates are set up based on size. And so if you're a small water system, we have a template for you. If you're big, we've got a different template for you there. We, Scott uh, Swanson here, the, the, address, the, the email address that I've got, can also help you take a look at your current uh, drought plan uh, and maybe offer some uh, tips on uh, making it a little more relevant. Of course, water rights. We've got Eliana here uh, tonight with us uh, to talk about uh, our answer questions on water rights. But if you are currently a surface water uh, system uh, and you're looking at possibly an alternative source, maybe drawing from another part of the tributary that you're currently drawing from or maybe a different tributary, uh, you need to get a hold of them and, and modify your, uh, your water rights permit. Outages or loss of pressure. Uh, in Annex V, uh, th this is where we go. Okay, so from this point forward, we've pretty much covered preparation, preparation, plan, plan. Now we enter into we don't have water anymore. You know, we're out, we're done, we're, we're out of water. What do we do now? Uh, De uh, Gabriella with TDM, they, they're the folks who, it's, it's kind of like the cavalry, kind of picture them as the cavalry. They come in, they're the ones that coordinate with HEB or Brookshire Brothers or these other folks that will bring in drinking water for your customers. Uh, they'll, they'll, they sometimes they work, they'll, they'll work with the National Guard. They did a lot of work during the, the wildfires. And what, what TDM essentially, they coordinate the resources of others to make sure that your citizens, your customers, uh, have uh, enough water to survive, essentially. It's not, it's more of a survival type thing. We're trying to keep folks, uh, you know, in enough water, but nothing like, you know, if you're out there filling up your swimming pool water, that's not going to cut it. So you guys follow me on that. The thing about it is, before these guys get involved, you have to exhaust local resources, okay? You have a district coordinator. Each county has a district coordinator that works for TDM. Okay, do, do y'all know who your district coordinator, your emergency coordinator is? Do we have any in the room? All right, excellent. We've got two in the back row. Good. Thank y'all for coming. One of the things that TDM will go, wants to know is they, they, they want to have the problem identified and then you have to ask the question, and because they're going to ask the question, is it an immediate need? If you have a situation where 
oh, you know, a couple of months, I'm going to be out of water or a couple of weeks or whatever. Well, you still need to be dealing with the planning part and the getting with the, the emergency drought task force to help you try to find or, uh, other alternatives to your water, that kind of thing. Kind of like where Grossbeck was, is putting in their temporary pipeline. Uh, if it, it's an immediate need, you're out of water. Okay, or you, you know, you're on the cusp of it. That's when these folks will, will come into play. You lose pressure, you do your boil water notice. Don't forget that. Uh, that's something that directly affects the health of your customers. Uh, disinfectant levels get low, pressure gets low. You, you, you know, you gotta make sure that your customers know that the water is not safe to drink as it is and it needs to be boiled before they uh, consume it. There are notification procedures. You guys probably have dealt with those in the past. Uh, your sampling requirements that go along with it. Don't forget to follow up on those things uh, before you bring your system back online. That's the last slide. Can I get a hallelujah? <laughs> thank, thank you. I want to say, just in, in conclusion, again, we, we can't change the tire for you. But, you know, we don't want to be the nail in the road that causes the flat tire, if that's, if I expand upon my scenario there a little bit. My, my call to action, review your current plans. Make sure you have current plans to review. Make the determination of whether or not that plan is relevant or adequate for what's going on right now. And then what may, the situation that we may find ourselves in, in in summer 2012. Another call to action. Commun communicate with us. Call us. Let us know what's going on. If you need assistance, give us a call. Again, if you're worried about enforcement, it shouldn't be an issue if you call the, the 1-800 number. Communicate and coordinate with each other. You know, some of y'all may be from neighboring water systems or at least regional water systems. I said this before, I'll say it again. Usually the best, the best option are options that are identified and implemented at the local level. Those are, those are, now not always, I'm not saying always, but there are a lot of local issues. A lot of these issues can be solved locally. And that's all I got. So I'll turn it back over uh, to Romero. And Thank we'll, you, Charlie. Yes. Appreciate it.